Okay, we are back live here in SiliconAngle.tv's The Cube special broadcast. We are live at Brocade's headquarters in Silicon Valley, California, San Jose, California, for a special broadcast for Bro Bro Brocade's Technology and Analyst Day. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconAngle.com, and I'm here with Stu Miniman, the analyst at Wikibon.org, breaking down what's going on with Brocade and in tech trends, and our next guest is Tony Underwood, pay per cloud EVP CMO. Welcome to The Cube. Thank you, good to be so, here. So we go out, we're talking to, to you know, executives, entrepreneurs, you're a customer of Brocade. Yes we are. And you have, have a really interesting solution that's really kind of hitting the sweet spot of the market. We've seen companies like Success Factors get bought by, by SAP, uh, people are moving stuff to the cloud. Tell us first your company, what you guys do, and how Brocade's helping you get there. Sure, uh, as Pay Per Cloud, uh, we provide infrastructure as a service and software as a service and then the managed services that wrap around that to help businesses in that SMB space go from uh, an on-premise solution to um, a cloud solution. And they can take advantage of either um, individual SaaS offerings or fully dedicated private cloud environments. So give an example of uh, a typical client engagement. Uh, typical client, actually it's uh, there's nothing typical about any client. <laughs> Give us a, uh, uh, a, but, but a, well, not normal, a good size yeah, so, you know, problem that you're solving. So we have customers uh, that sit in the space that we really want to be in. Our target customer is that mid-sized customer that maybe has uh, 250 to 1,000 employees that have solutions that are costing too much, that are too difficult and complex to manage on an ongoing basis and they need their IT staff to be focused on solving business problems, not dealing with IT infrastructure issues. Like operations, managing the mail servers exactly. and the applications. Exactly, there's no reason for a business of that size right now to have an exchange solution that's sitting on premise. Yeah. Right? I hear that all the time. Right. <laughs> that is one workload of many workloads yeah. that makes sense to move out in the cloud, but what we're finding our greatest success right now being is finding the managed services that help that customer migrate yeah. so that they can have, it's not an all or none answer. And some companies are looking at moving to the cloud as being an all or none. Yeah, yeah, there's some liberation involved because you're essentially taking away a huge pain point for them because stuff is breaking, they got to upgrade servers, it's such cost. So you've got this OpEx kind of threshold where it's costing them some money. Mm -hmm. And then they hit this point where they go, wow, we got to either buy more gear and keep it on prem or, so they got to do the economic analysis. Is that a fair, accurate assessment of, kind of what's happening? My background, I was a CIO for many years, and the decisions that really were important to me was, can I solve my business problems and not spend a bunch of money doing it, <laughs> right? And so there's a couple ways in which you can do that. And I kept having uh, my IT staff come to me and say, I need another 100,000 or $200,000 in order to buy additional storage or additional servers. When you can turn that into a monthly cost, and you can control and manage that cost, as a CIO, it's, yeah. you can make better decisions. And, and, and you know, back in the day, in classifying that environment, you were the, you know, the no person. Everything was no, right? You know? <laughs> exactly. I mean, the no ops was a, was a term that we kick around for the ideal operation, but they called the CIO a no op because all he would say is no, no. to operations. So, <laughs> so again, this is the OpEx problem. You know, a lot of money goes into the operations. So talk about some of the challenges that you need to execute on to develop this because you know, obviously infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service is cutting edge. That's really a big part of the infrastructure now. So as you do your job and want to scale out your, your client base, uh, you want to keep your marginal costs down and increase your revenue, right? So okay, it's a nice economic situation. What are some of the technical challenges you have there? Uh, well, one of the key ones, and part of the reason we're here is, um, in our old infrastructure, we had a problem being able to scale and control the costs. Our customers need speed, they need the ability when they're putting up either a private cloud that has VMs inside it, or virtual machines, they need the ability to be able to get speed, and move those and provision VMs quickly, right? Yes. So, Tony, can you talk to us a little bit about kind of your growth pro profile? What are you seeing in your environment? 
and, and specifically on the network, you know, uh, what, what do you see both from a network standpoint and kind of a virtualization standpoint? Is, is virtualization part of your environment? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Well, so uh, where I was going with that is we had an environment that had uh, the ability to have eight servers in Iraq. Okay. After we deployed our new infrastructure, we had the capacity of 12 servers in Iraq. Okay. okay, so I have a cost structure that can support now on the same footprint, 12 servers. The real magic though wasn't the number of servers, it was the number of VMs that I can support inside that. It grew from around 100 to 500. There was a significant improvement in the ability for me to sell virtual machines or resource out to my customer with a cost structure that stayed in the same footprint. So the economics for us as we look at our, our growth prospects, if we can continue to grow the business without the cost growing in direct proportion to that, we have a business model that becomes very can, interesting. Can you walk us through the decision process on how you ended up partnering with Brocade? Absolutely. And what, what, tell us what the technologies you're using. So we looked at a number of different solutions. There's a lot of good companies out there. I'm not going to knock any of the others that we looked at, but they didn't Come on, you can have tell us. <laughs> Inside the cube, uh, we keep it quiet. Do we really? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, as we're just broadcasting share. out to the, uh, the, to world, the World Wide live. Web, right. It's okay, Cisco. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, oh. Microsoft. All right, we are a, um, <laughs> uh, a strong believer in the solution that we put in with Brocade. Because it wasn't just a matter of whether or not they had a technical solution, it was did they have a technical solution that made, us, made, that made sense from a cost perspective, and did they have a service uh, and support capability that was going to work with our business? And so they helped us employ the, or deploy this new solution. And we had Askia, who was one of the, um, the engineers who helped us actually roll it out. Um, we had a, a live customer base. It wasn't like we could just yeah. pull everything out and switch over. We had to migrate while we were live. So, and so my question for you is, one for the audience that might not be in the inside the ropes around the brocade stuff that Stu goes into great detail on, but more of around Ethernet fabrics. And, and so everyone knows about Ethernet that's in IT. Ethernet's great and it's fast and we all know going back to the legacy of the internet. But what is, what, explain what Ethernet fabric is. I mean, because you know, the word fabric is tossed around a lot. It's been, you know, obviously in the networking landscape. I got a fabric, I got V-fabric on you know, a VMware. So what, what is doesn't, fabric, what does Ethernet fabric mean? Doesn't fabric sound cool? I mean, it's like, it's a know, great marketing term. Is it polyester, is it cotton? It sounds I mean, it's good. It's all kinds yeah, of yeah, different fabrics. We said, you know, I know people that have their cloud security blanket to, to kind of fabric, <laughs> but yeah, this is something different, so. Um, the fabric is the ability, and this is from my interpretation, I'm not the IT guy, I'm not the CIO. I'm you a were marketing a guy, you were but a I was. You were a CIO, and explain to yourself the, what a fabric is, the, the, Ethernet fabric, the, the core The fabric is the ability to have a layer across your, uh, your networking infrastructure where it looks as one solution to you. You don't have a bunch of pieces, you have the ability to look at a fabric or a holistic view of your uh, networking switching so routing it looks like infrastructure. a standard, it looks like a standard in a way, because it's not a lot of complexity, right? Sure. Mm -hmm. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Okay. So what is their fabric? When I put, I'm sorry, but when I put resource into that fabric, or when I add components to it, it just expands the fabric. Got it, so yeah, automation. It, it's a pooled resource, exactly. Yeah, that's a, yeah. yeah. Okay, great, so what about Brocade's fabric? Because we had Mike on earlier, and all their top executives and some geeks here, deploying fabrics, and what do you say, in seconds, minutes? You know, you got high school kids up here deploying fabrics. Well, Ethernet fabrics, so it's that simple. Sounds almost too good to be true. What does that mean? Well, uh, I must confess, we didn't deploy fabrics in uh, a matter of seconds. Now, maybe the fabric could have been deployed in a matter of a few minutes. We were really more interested in a holistic solution because at the end of the day, our customers don't care about a fabric. What they care about is, are you solving my business problem? Yeah. So we had a whole bunch of other decision points that needed to be brought into this whole analysis beyond the fabric component. The so fabric enables our ability to do something. So talk about the impact, to the, let's get back to the meat and potatoes of, of your gross margin, which is basically your managed services. There's a lot of gross profit involved in services. So does that fabric help you deploy services faster? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. And then the latency that we experienced dramatically improved when, from milliseconds to nanoseconds. So the speed and the performance of the back end allows us not only from a scalability standpoint uh, to put more load on it, 
uh, to add more VMs, um, but to be able to manage that infrastructure more cost effectively. It takes fewer people to manage the infrastructure. Tony, I was wondering if you could kind of share with us what you're seeing from your customers. You know, how is the adoption of all the, you know, infrastructure as a service, uh, you know, software as a service. Um, are CIOs, you know, readily adopting it? Is it still something that they're, they're fighting and the CEO's telling them, you know, I read about this, you need to go do it. You know, where are we in this process? And, uh, you know, as a former CIO, you know, what advice do you give to the, well, the CIOs out there? Yeah, there's a lot of shift going on right now. It's all over the map, quite frankly. And so I personally don't know of the specific trend. You have a lot of people that are viewing the cloud as a very, very big security hole until they understand that the cloud is a buzz term, talking about something that's already existed for a long time, it's just evolved, and the way it's being consumed is now different. If you look at making a decision to put your enterprise class um, uh, ERP system in the cloud, you shouldn't be putting it in a public cloud. You can put it in a very highly scalable, secure, private cloud environment, but it all depends upon the workload that is being put out into the cloud, which is where we as Paper Cloud come into the mix and where we excel is finding the right solution for the customer. It's not a all or nothing type of uh, solution. So Tony, we're wrapping up our day here. We've got a couple more minutes left, but I want to just ask you some more, you know, some more personal business-oriented questions around your business and, and, and to share experiences with the audience out there. A whole new breed of entrepreneurs are entering the marketplace, leveraging especially the, the rapid, agile capabilities of the cloud with this massive surge of, of SaaS, et cetera. So, you know, it's fairly easy to program to get to off the ground, but also to scale a business requires some discipline. You guys are doing that. What advice would you share the folks out there that are deploying on the cloud to doing these kinds of roles? So a lot more boutiques and or new service providers are coming into the market. Uh, it's a huge opportunity. They're faster, they're nimbler, they got lower costs, and can generate you know, still some good sizable revenue. So, you know, obviously you're doing a lot of great things. What advice would you share with folks out there in that regard? It's a very interesting question. As a technologist, uh, you would think that my first response might be something about some cool technology. The advice is as simple as this. Technology is an enabler, and if you're not solving a business problem, and if the customer is not your ultimate focus, you don't have a business, no matter how cool your technology is. And you know, Brocade comes in, there's a great new tool, a set of tools that you can put inside your infrastructure to make things faster, better, smarter, cheaper. If you lose sight of the end goal, and that is solving a customer's problem, you have no business. So, the advice is, stay focused on solving business problems for customers. And how do some of the cloud things that you've learned lower your cost to do that? I mean, is, is, there, is there some tips you have? Not necessarily technology, but you know, business practices. Could be hiring, outsourcing, um, using other applications. I mean, what core competency should someone develop if you had to make a, a call? Like, okay, like, not so much a tech feature or this virtualization, but like, also you got to get that customer, but you got to get it in a way that lower costs, you make more money, it's simple. Black line, red line, keep the cost lower than the revenue, right? <laughs> and still serve the customer. Is there a core competency relative to cloud and or these, these new technologies? A core competency? Um, you know, I wouldn't say, I, I specifically had an answer around core competency, other than to go back to what I just said, and all business success is based on making a customer happy and solving a problem. And if you don't do that, again, it doesn't matter what you've done. And it doesn't matter if you've got the greatest uh, business model for staffing and, or the greatest, hey, I can control my costs here or there. If you're not solving a problem, yeah. none, none of the rest of that stuff matters. All right, so my final question for you is this. So as an ex-CIO and someone who's out there deploying some cutting edge stuff, solving business problems, Try to, try to imagine if you were a CIO today. What's going on in your mind today? If you're a CIO today, what's going on in your mind? Obviously there's a lot of pressure on the top line and bottom line, but what's the psychology right now of a CIO in, uh, 20, in 2012 going into 2013? Always up, always available, low cost, gotta have more. <laughs> always up, always available. And now uh, you've got environments that must be up 24-7, 365. There's no downtime. 
So in order to uh, be successful and sleep at night as a CIO, you have to have solutions that you don't have to worry about. They have to always be up and always available. How are those CIOs, just to follow up on, how are those CIOs motivating their staff if they have staffs? And who, you know, what's the challenging around the, the management of the people? Uh, you, I'm not sure if this is where you're going, but let me just say this. The a challenge sometimes with the cloud is there's a perception by IT managers that the cloud somehow eliminates the need for them. It doesn't. It actually, if employed correctly, uh, will enable them to focus on more business oriented or business needed problems rather than things that don't really add economic value to the business, either revenue or cost savings. Great. Okay, well we have one minute left, so I'm going to answer one last question, really it's really the final question, and that is, what's going on for your business this next year? What are your goals, and what do you hope to do in the next year? Well, we're really excited about the next year. We're going to be adding a lot more products and services and expanding our partner network. The, uh, the partner network we see as something that is going to allow us to be a strong back-end infrastructure and service, uh, software as a service provider and managed service provider uh, delivering solutions to MSPs and consulting firms where they can now have high availability solutions that they can provide out to their customer without all the costs and infrastructure needed to build their own. And partnering that way becomes a win-win-win because it becomes a multi-tiered touch to the customer. And that customer gets a closer uh, connection to the person solving their problem. Okay, Tony Underwood with Paper Cloud, great uh, success story, entrepreneurs out there making new things happen. Fabric is an is a expanded resource, it helps drive revenue and profit. Uh, great stuff in the networking space. Thanks for joining theCUBE. We'll be right back here at SiliconANGLE TV, special broadcast here at Brocade's headquarters right after this short break.